Panted after the water. Father and our God, this is our submission this morning that nothing in this world can satisfy. We have searched the whole world with its glamour, with its riches, and we found nothing for us here that can satisfy our soul. And this morning we have come to drink of the water of life. Lord, may you feed us to satisfaction. May you quench our thirst and may our soul find rest in you thank you precious father in jesus name we pray praise the lord choir thank you very much uh, the spirit of god is at work and the holy spirit has spoken through the choir to us even the uh the title of this morning's sermon uh it is titled a thirsting soul a thirsting soul and just like this choir sang nothing in this world can satisfy can satisfy us our text is taken from psalm 63 verse 1 to 11 and isaiah 55 1 to 3 psalm 63 1 to 11 and isaiah 55 1 to 3 i prefer the nlt version if i can get one Psalm 63. Okay. The NLT. Is that not available? Okay, let me just. So, 63. Okay. Oh, all right. Much? Thank you very much. A Psalm of David regarding the t a time when David was in the wilderness of Judah. God you are my god i earnestly search for you my soul thirsts for you my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water verse two quickly please i've seen you in your sanctuary and gaze upon your power and glory your unfailing love is better than life itself how i praise you i will praise you as long as i live lifting up my hands to you in prayer you satisfy me more than the riches the richest feast i will praise you with songs of joy i lie awake thinking of you meditating on you through the night because you are my helper i sing for joy in the shadow of your wings i cling to you your strong right hands hold me securely. But those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin. They will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword 
and become the food of jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear to tell the truth will praise him, while liars will be silenced. Thank you very much. Isaiah 55, 1 to 3. Quickly. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that, that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in our hearts in Jesus' name. This morning, the Lord is calling everyone that is thirsty. We are all invited to come to the waters and this and those without money to come and buy and eat. Food and water are very essential for human sustenance. Since the fall of man at Eden, these essentials of life have had to be struggled or labored for. According to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And to the man he said, since you have listened, or since you listened to your wife and ate from the, those, from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is caused because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles too for you though, you, though you will eat of its grains. 19. By the sweat of your brow, you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. That had been the story or the case of man after the fall. Uh, to the extent that there is increased competition for food and water, and it has become survival of the fittest. So, and man is ready to do anything to satisfy this crave for survival or sustenance. One thing that is clear, though, is the fact that the poor, that is those who have no money, they are always disadvantaged in their choice of or access to both food and water. But today, I mean, not always, I mean, not in the kingdom of God anyway, because today we've been asked to come, even those of us that have no money, to come and eat of the choicest food and drink of best waters. Praise the Lord. For us as Christians, this world must always be a dry and thirsty land. The new life that grace has implanted in us must find nothing here below on the, on the which it can feed. The things that are seen, they are too material and defiled to sustain life. And that's why Jesus was speaking in John chapter 6, verse 25 to 27. John 6, 25 to 27. He was speaking to those who, he said, a huge crowd kept following him wherever. 25, 25, 6, 25. John 6, 25. Anyway, I will paraphrase that. Jesus was speaking to the crowd that, you know, followed him after he has fed them in the earlier scriptures. And he was telling them, you know, giving them the reason why they were looking for him. Because he knew that they were not after him for the world, but for the food that he fed them with. Is it impossible that you give me John 6, 25? Sorry. Okay. Yes, you can read for me, please. When they found him, Yes. I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Labor not for the, please, let's, let it remain. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, 
but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him had God the Father sealed. Praise the Lord. And if you also read further, verse 47 to 51 of that same chapter 6 of John, Jesus was talking about, you know, he said, Very, very, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. And he, the next verse, I am that bread of life. Please give me up to verse 51. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Praise the Lord. So Jesus is here emphasizing the fact that the, the physical food and the physical water, they will perish. But as many that will eat of him, the bread of life, that we will eat eternally. We will have everlasting life. And this only food can only come as we, as we are partakers of his divine grace by, by uh, salvation. Praise the Lord. As believers, we must not find anything in this world by which our soul can find rest. Just like that dove that Noah sent out of the ark. You remember in Genesis chapter 8, I think verse 9 or so, Noah sent the doves out to test whether the, 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 the waters are seeded. But the Bible said that the dove flew around, they have nowhere to find to rest. And so they return to the ark. The same way, when we have given our life to Jesus, when we have surrendered our life, we must find nothing in this world to rest our soul, except we come back to him. And that's why I said, you know, the Holy Spirit must have ministered to the choir as they sang that song, that nothing in this world can satisfy. And today, I'm praying earnestly that this truth will come to our, to our hearts, that there is nothing in this world that can satisfy and i'm not talking about the you know the negative world i'm talking about even the world as it at its best the world at its best riches best you know whatever it can offer us the world even when there is rain rainfall you know we're talking about patched land the world is a patched land despite the fact that it may rain there may be rain of abundance upon us yet our soul is not made to find satisfaction in those things. The satisfaction that our soul requires can only come from him. Praise the Lord. So I'm not painting the world, I mean this picture of the world, uh, about the world under a sorrowful aspect alone, but of the world even at its best. It must remain a dry land for saints. Even when its rains are falling, like I said, even when the rains of abundance are falling upon us, we must consider this word. Jesus was very emphatic in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 to 37. When he looked at all the world with his riches and everything that the world has to offer, and he said to us, Mark 8, Mark 8, 36. Yes, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? That was Jesus asking, what is the benefit of gaining the whole world? You can imagine how, you know, seemingly uh, rich the whole world may be, may appear to be. But Jesus is saying that, look, even the whole world in its riches, in all, at its best, is not worth losing one's soul for. Verse 37, he said, is anything worth more than your soul? That is the question that God is throwing at us this morning. What is it that we are attaching so much importance to in this world? Is it power? Is it position? Is it affluence? Is it prosperity? Thank God for those things. But your soul, 
will not and cannot find satisfaction in those things. Because those things, the world and those things will perish. And only those who find rest in the Lord that will survive. Praise the Lord. So when the world dresses itself in scarlet and puts on its sick and, and satins, it must remain a poor world to us as believers. The world may paint her face and adorn her head, but she must remain a Jezebel for all that is, for all that is worth. So brethren, it's important that we, take, we beware that we are aware of the futility of this world, or futility of this world rather, to satisfy the soul of a believer. We must not attach any importance to anything in this world because they will all fly away. They will all perish. And it's only the soul that, have been, that is secured in the Lord that will live forever. And how can we, I mean, how can we ensure that our soul is secured? You know, Jesus was talking about, you know, which, that where he was advising us about where to lay up our treasures. He said we should lay up our treasures in heaven where there are no moats, where there are no thieves, where there are no, uh, where no one can boggle. But anything that is laid on this earth is susceptible to all those decay and to depreciation and whatever you may want to ascribe to it. There is life eternal only in Jesus. And that is why Jesus calls out all who are weary and are heavy laden to come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He said, Come, all who are weary and heavy laden. I don't know how many of such people are here this morning. Jesus said, Come. Don't, don't hold back when he calls you. Because he has the ability and the, and the capacity to give you this rest. He said, and I will give you rest. You know, there's a longing in our hearts for rest. And that longing can only be satisfied by him. He said, I will give you rest. And this rest, the first rest here, is the rest that we receive as salvation. When we yield our life to him, then he gives, he gives us this rest. And the next verse, let's read on. Verse 29. He said, take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you. It's important that having received the first rest, then we will take Jesus' yoke upon us. So that he can teach us. And how do we, how are we being taught? You know, we we learn, or let me say, yes. How, how do we learn? You know, because someone who is a teacher teaches, and the student does what they learn. How can we learn from him? He said, because, he said, let me teach you. So we learn by watching him, by listening to him, by seeing how he conducts and comports himself. And he said, because I am humble and gentle at heart. Jesus is humble and gentle at heart. The Sunday school teaching this morning was talking about, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And I, I heard the teachers asking us that how can we learn, you know, the new, uh, the new nature that we receive. Because every habit is learned, so we can also unlearn it. We can, you know, we can unlearn it. And Jesus is saying that we should come. That when we watch him, when we listen to him, then we can learn this new lifestyle. Because I'm humble and gentle at heart. Then when we have taken due diligence to those teachings, it is until then that we will find rest for our soul. You know, the second rest here is up to us to find. The first rest was given freely to everyone that come. But this second rest, we have a part to play in finding it. Praise the Lord. 
The Bible says, narrow, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Only few people find it. Praise God. So, it is not enough for us to receive the first rest. Because the first rest is just the general rest that we receive as salvation. But if this must be sustained, if we must secure the rest for our soul, then we must find this second rest. And this second rest, like I said, has to do, has a lot to do with us. To the extent to which we are submissive, to the extent to which we are ready to learn, to the extent to which we are ready to take up his yoke upon our, upon our neck. We have given an analogy of what it means to be yoked together. The two animals are supposed to work together, you know, in those days before uh, the advent of tractors. You know, our forefathers, they, they, all, they also had tractors. They yoked two bulls together. They put a rope, I mean, a rod between their neck. And they'll be tilling the ground with it. And we said that if any of those two animals outran the other one, what are, what, is, what, what are the things that is likely to happen? There'll be injury on both of them, isn't it? Yes. So it's the same way. When we are yoked with Jesus, we are supposed to go at the same pace with him. To learn him, to watch him, doing his things. Then we put our leg in his, in his, in his footstep. That's way to learn of him. And he said, For I am milk and lowly at heart. Uh, our teacher this morning was talking about, you know, uh, opposite. Is the opposite of, what, of certain virtues or certain vices? He said, In the place of uh, wickedness, what should we give? I remember him saying that we should give uh, goodness or something like that. And these are the things that Jesus has come to offer us. The world, has, I mean, by nature, has its own set pattern. As far as the world is concerned, the, the, the hen uh, destroy my medicine, or as he said, I will break his egg. The Yoruba will say, and that's accepted. That's the standard of the world. Oh, you are good to me, I'll be good to you. You are wicked to me, I'll be wicked to you. That's the world standard. But Jesus has come with a new, with a new standard. He said, love those who hate you. How easy is, how easy is it to do that? Is it very easy? No. He said, uh, those that despitefully, despitefully use you. He said, you should, what did he do? I mean, what did he say about that? Matthew chapter, I think, is this chapter 5 now? The Sermon on the Mount. Remember, when he was teaching us the new lifestyle, the kingdom lifestyle. And those are the things that we must come to learn with him. They are not things that we, we, that the world can teach us. Everything that the world will teach us are things that are contrary to the spirit. And this morning we have come, he, has, he said that we should come and learn. Learn so that we can find rest to our soul. This world has nothing to offer us. Yes, we're in this world, we must, I'm not saying that we must not uh, strive to, to make, to make a living and to live comfortably. But even when God has blessed us with those things, we must detach ourselves from those material things. Because they will not take us to heaven. Naked we came and naked will return. So, but those things are meant to be used you know, to propagate the kingdom, to ensure, to secure our place in heaven. But the irony is that those blessings have become a snare for some of us. Those blessings, you ask some people why they are not, you know, up and doing for God. They refer to, you know, the business or to whatever blessing God has given them. Meanwhile, those blessings are meant to harness. They are meant to, you know, to, to give you Leverage to be able to serve God even more effectively. We must address our heart today. I don't know what are the things that we have attached our heart to that is disrupting us. Because those, everything in this world has the ability to, to, to blow our vision 
of heaven. If heaven is our goal, then we must, our eyes must be single about going to heaven. Praise the Lord. Let us know from today that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world that can satisfy us. And he that has created us has created us with such void and is ready to fill it up when we ask of him. Jesus was speaking to that woman at the well of Sychar. He said, if only you know who is talking to you, you should have asked him and he will have given you uh, rivers of living water. So that you don't need to come to this well often to draw water because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. It means that even the best uh, water, the best spring, when you drink it, it's just a matter of time you will still feel thirsty. Is that not correct? Yes, you will feel thirsty. When you eat the best meal, I don't know the best cuisine, maybe Chinese, I don't know, but even most of those expensive food, you find out that when you, after eating them within, I don't know what they put inside, after a few minutes, you start feeling hungry again. So there is nothing to them. Food to the belly, belly to the food. He said both of them will, will perish. But can we spend our energy and our time in seeking for that, for that eternal bread, for that bread that he is willing to give us so that when we eat it, we will hunger no more. And when we drink of that rivers of life, we will thirst no more. That is the challenge that God is calling on us this morning. Praise the Lord. I will ask the multimedia to just play a, a song to us this morning. It's a song by Don Muen. We all know it. But, you know, the words are quite very instructive. streams make glad the city of God the city of God so come if you're wounded no sad Your heart is searching. Oh, come in your 
soul is thirsty. Draw near and drink of the mercy of Jesus Christ. At the river of love, drink of the mercy of Jesus Christ. At the river of love, drink of the mercy of Jesus Christ. The river of love. Brethren, that's the, invi that's the invitation this morning. Are there souls that are thirsty in the house? Are there people that are hungry? Jesus is calling you to come. Shall we rise up as we pray for those that will yield to this divine call this morning? He said he wants to give your soul rest. He wants to give you rest. Are you here? You have not given your life to Jesus. And you desire rest for your soul. The first invitation is open to you. It's open to all. Can you come so that you can find rest for your soul? The rest of us, as many of us that, are, that have given our life to Jesus, shall we just begin to pray for, you know, that we will yield to his second call of coming to him to learn of him. To learn of him in discipleship, to learn of him, you know, by, by way of him mentoring our lives, by way of devotion, by way of consecration. And to those that just want to receive the first rest, only those people will lift up their hands wherever they are standing this morning and say, Lord Jesus, here am I. God bless that hand. God bless you, my brother. Any other person that wants to join? Is there any other person that wants to join my brother? My brother, are you raising your hands or not? Okay, you're not. Is there any other person that wants to say, Lord Jesus, I want to come and receive rest for my soul? Oh, I found out that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy. That all, true satisfaction and true, true rest can only be found in you. Any other person like that? Any person like that this morning? Any person that wants to say, Lord Jesus... I desire rest for my soul. This world is full of, is full of anxiety, full of worries. Oh, I want to find rest for my soul. Let's just pray that Lord, give me rest for my soul. Having known that nothing in this world can satisfy. My Father, my God, I long for that real satisfaction that is in you. I long for it, oh God. I long for it. Oh God. I don't want to remain on patched land forever. Even the world at its, at its best, I found nothing here to satisfy me. Thank God. Thank you for all the things, the beautiful things that you have given me. The wonderful children, the wonderful career, the, the mansions you've given me. But Lord, I find no satisfaction in them. My true satisfaction lies in you alone. Lord, let my soul not be weary any longer. Let me find real satisfaction in you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Our eternal Father, we submit this morning that there is nothing in this world that can satisfy us. And that is why we have come today to ask that you will please bring us into our rest. Bring us to the place, Lord, where we find real satisfaction in you. Take our attention from the things of this world. And let our attention and our focus be on the things of eternal value. We pray that every attachment to this world, you will cause to decrease in us. That our desire and our longing will be for you and for you alone. This is our prayer, O oh God. Please help us to walk in this reality. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that the world will beckon on us. We continue to attract us. You know, with things that dazzles. That dazzles the eyes and the, and, and the heart. But Lord, help us, oh Lord, to, uh, to, to remain focused. So that our, our, our heart will not be on those things. Yet those things are needed for this world. But we will only use them as tools to enrich our soul in your kingdom. Let this be our pursuit, Lord. We thank you because you do this for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.